On March 20th, 2024, a paper was published that's going to change the way academics view the peopling of Easter Island. Chilean archaeologists found solid evidence that the first people that we know of that settled the island brought South American foods with them. And while a connection between Easter Island and South America has been posited by many academics for years now, a truly ancient connection has been kind of mocked for a while as well. I mean, guys like Graham Hancock, they talk about it, and then that pushes academics away from the notion, and it kind of tantalizes the public with it, so it, it kind of creates this mixed bag. But now we have new evidence to kind of weigh in on this. Now, the paper's authors do tell us we need to be cautious in a couple of places, so let's take a look at what the paper has to say, what its findings are, where they tell us to be cautious, and what the implications of it might be. Let's take a look at the Moai with a new set of eyes. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to the Dunking. Easter Island was first settled around a thousand years ago, according to archaeology. Bones, refuse, and other datable remains have been found at the oldest excavated site of Anakena that have been used to inform this dating. The site is recorded by both local traditions and the accounts of early European explorers as the place where the king lived, so the royal city, so to speak. Naturally, it is assumed to be the oldest site on the island, although of course this is nowhere near certain. The site has been excavated numerous times since the 1960s, with several artifacts being taken to the Sebastian Engelbert Anthropological Museum of Easter Island over the years. Now, important to our discussion here are the obsidian blades that were found at the lowest layers of the site. They've been stored in the same museum for the last three or four decades, and when our paper's authors went and grabbed them, obviously they were hoping modern technology would be able to give us some new information. And they were not disappointed. In the tiny grooves on the smooth obsidian blades, they found microscopic starch grains that typically range between 1 and 100 micrometers in length. That's 1 25,000th of an inch for you non-European types. Even the ancient samples can be visually compared using modern equipment, and utilizing AI to find patterns has increased the accuracy of these simple techniques. The technique being which plants have matching starch grains. This is determined from size, shape, symmetry, and this little X in the middle right there. Using this technique, scientists have been able to identify plants by their starch grains for decades now. Regular light microscopes allow you to do this with a lot of different plants, and now we've got better microscopes. So this isn't some made-up technique conjured up by some pseudoscientist that got their degree at the freaking mail-order University of Wu. This is real stuff, a real technique, and it's painstakingly laid out in detail in the paper. And they washed each blade with distilled water just to make sure there was no contaminants over the last few years. They picked out each individual little thing with a single-use toothpick that they threw away afterwards to make sure there was no contaminants on and everything. If you want to know all the details, they even use controls, right? They if you want all the details, it's down below. Okay, I'm not going to... The boring part, we're going to skip. 46 of the ancient starch grains were identified, with cassava manioc, akira, the sweet potato, and xanthosoma being na plants native to South America that were identified. Also unexpected was breadfruit and ginger. Both have origins to the west of Easter Island, and neither had been documented here before. Cassava is a type of tuber, similar to a potato. Tapioca is made from the starch of a certain type of cassava, so you know the plant by taste, if not by name. Akira is another edible root, often called Indian shot, used for feeding humans and livestock. Xanthosoba is yet another tuber. You may be noticing a pattern here, and I really don't think I need to introduce a sweet potato to you. Software and fancy math used to identify and determine accuracy gave percentages of reliability on the identification of each grain. Obviously, they were identified with different degrees of accuracy. Only two grains of the sweet potato hit 90% or more, with six of them overlapping enough with manioc that the authors thought it was important to mention we need to exercise caution here. However, manioc is one of the aforementioned South American foods that they found, so either way, the implications of the initial settling of the Anacana region of Easter Island, including South American domesticated plants, isn't changed. Both of these plants came from South America. Manioc was only identified with a 90% probability from a single grain. Others had lower degrees of probability. Xanathosoma was visually identified by a solitary grain. No probability is assigned to it. Akira had two starch grains with a 90% and a 100% probability. So it's a small amount of data, but the implications are huge. The first people to settle at Anakina brought foods from South America with them. The results for other plants identified are similar, with ginger being the most important find among the non-South American varieties, as this is the furthest east it has been found in ancient times. 
But all this data is impactful. The limited studies done on the agriculture in the earliest known sites has shown no pollen of domesticated plants whatsoever, leading many to assume that Easter Islanders were purely hunter-gatherers when they first arrived, living off the sea in what they could scavenge. Now they certainly hunted. Dolphin bones are found in abundance at the lowest levels of Anakena, with the frequency tapering off over time. Point is, this pushes the dating of agriculture on the island back a little bit, and it also implies that the place was settled in two runs, basically. Like the first run, you find the island, you explore it, and then the second run, you come back with foods and stuff that you know are going to do all right in there. And that actually ties in pretty well with the legends that the Easter Islanders record. They speak of them having a dream, and the king having a dream, him sending seven people over to the island, they find the island, they explore the island, they come back, and then they send an expedition to settle. Now, it doesn't talk about them bringing foods, but a dual stage of settlement like that absolutely makes sense, not just to me. Academics think this as well. I, I got this idea from the paper. Don't blame me for plagiarizing nobody. I didn't do it. Which brings us to another point, how legend and myth and Easter Island are all bedfellows. Thor Heyerdahl, one of the earliest archaeologists to visit Easter Island, had a belief that the South Americans had settled the Polynesian Islands and in fact were Polynesian ancestors. Now he also believed they were white, descendants of the white-skinned Viracocha people. Now there's a lot of arguments about those Viracocha myths today, the legitimacy of those legends, how accurate they are to the original myths of the indigenous South Americans, whether they had white-skinned gods or not. The opinion of most academics today is the myths were changed, the white-skinned, bearded people were added by the conquistadors to bolster their claim on power. Now, I'm of a slightly different opinion. I believe the conquistadors elevated the status of these white, bearded people that were already in the record. I think they just, like, boosted them up to godhood status to, you know, help bolster their claim on the place. You know, be, being an occupier is hard work, they say. But, um... At any rate, this Thor Thayer et al. guy, he, he believed that the uh, South Americans settled Easter Island. That was his deal. That That's what I'm getting at here. I'm not trying to get too far into the weeds with that. It's, just, it's important to mention that he wasn't talking about indigenous Native Americans settling there in the way we would think of it. He was thinking of more like your, your Roanoke-style Native Americans. Now this idea has been met with skepticism over the years in no small part due to its association with Viracocha, Quetzalcoatl, and all the Graham Hancockian stuff that's associated with those guys. No serious academic questions that some contact happens at some point. I mean, they're sweet potatoes when the first Europeans arrived, for example. But how long they had been there was another thing altogether. Thor Heyerdahl pointed out the similarities in the platforms the Moai are stood on and some Bolivian pre-Incan constructions. Also something you would find Hancock doing. Now, in more recent years, we have seen some DNA evidence support the idea that Easter Island and South America were in contact at least a little. There are certainly Native American genes present in the Easter Island people. There's also some Australasian DNA in the South American indigenous population. Geneticists are still examining the idea, but currently they're of the opinion that DNA didn't come from Australasia directly to South America. But the descendants of people who had interbred with the Polynesians brought the DNA markers from Australasia. Now, I mention this because it seems Easter Island may have been a bit of a melting pot back in those days, a, a place where the Polynesians that were living closer to Asia and the place where the Polynesians that were living closer to South America might have found themselves and met. As a matter of fact, it could have even been a pilgrimage site. I mean, we do see some signs of like a little bit of goofy stuff there. It's got. We, there, there is some megalithic construction all over the Polynesian world, but the, the Moai definitely stand out. There's no question there. And so does the script. I mean, there's not very much uh, Polynesian writing at all, but the Rongo Rongo script, I think it's pronounced. You guys know me in pronunciations. I'm sorry. I pronounce pronunciation way better than the rest of that crap. <laughs> pronounce. Anyway. Easter Island may have been a spot that you know that, that, that you would send an elite to. You would send a, somebody that was rich and fancy to might go there or something. Who knows? It's hard to say for sure. But it does. It is a candidate if their mixing DNA is not happening in in Australasia and it's not happening in South America. Easter Island may have been where that DNA was mingled. It is worth mentioning the foodstuffs found at Atacana were considerably different than those found in other places on the island. Areas of human occupation that lack the megalithic moai tend to have large numbers of fish bones which are almost absent from Anakena. And almost no dolphin bones at all are in the more pleb sites, while at Anakena there is tons of dolphin bones, especially in the lower layers. The food seemed to have changed over time like I just said about the dolphins. As they declined, chickens seemed to rise as a food for the wealthy. 
Now before the starch grain study, the consensus was agriculture began after a few hundred years of occupation. Now it seems it may have been planned for the start, at least from the people who settled Anakana. Now it's not hard to imagine a world where Easter Island was kind of a hub of trading, maybe not a hub, but a gas station in this giant spot between South America and uh, Australia and Asia and all these islands in between. You, you, you could see potentially Easter Island being a spot that people would stop. Maybe it was a place of legend. Maybe it was a place that some people visited. Other people had never even been there, but they believed it existed. And you, you keep going further to the west or the east and people are like, yeah, it's a place of bullshit. It don't exist at all. It's tough to say for sure, but we do know there was a lot of interconnectedness in that area that isn't really borne out in the artifacts. We don't see a ton of artifacts being spread around the region, but the better our technology gets, the better we find DNA and plants that have been spread around the region pretty obviously by humans. Obviously, our DNA was spread that way, but the plants as well, right? And now, again, this is the kind of thing that's been thrown out for a long time, that baby with the bathwater kind of thing, right? And, and it's, I think this is a great example of how the alternate history take. May, yes, there are parts of it that were not completely accurate, but fundamentally it's giving um, the, the Thor Heyerdahl take, the people came from South America and settled here because the damn rocks looked the same isn't so crazy all of a sudden is it and so this is something that we, we might you know find you're not going to find academics positing to, to, you don't even seem talking about this one because it now doesn't no no some of them will talk about it, don't get me wrong but this is not the kind of thing that they're going to tout and walk around with because it, it, they've been saying for a while that, that anybody who talked the idea that these rocks are related between these two sites is stupid but now all of a sudden no nah, man they quite possibly were in they didn't build like they did at man Madal, did they nope not those polynesian style they built like the South Americans did more. Maybe they were influenced from there when they were bringing their freaking yams with them. Not such a crazy idea anymore, is it? <sighs> but you know, this kind of stuff often does get thrown out like a baby with the bathwater, as Dr. Miano once said in his video on pseudoscience. You know, if it looks like a duck kind of thing, right? Hope you understand. Well, I hope you understand that um, yeah, that, that kind of mentality is frequently bullshit and doesn't get us anywhere. It's just skepticism turned cynicism and that is not helpful to science or to anyone else